Welcome, everybody. Uh, if there's anybody who needs no introduction, it's Secretary Albright, who seems to chair everything I'm involved with, including three meetings we just had yeah. on the Partnership for a New Beginning, the U.S.-Palestinian Partnership, the Program Strategy Group of the Aspen Institute, and among other things, you were um, the chair of this uh, NATO 2020. Um, and let's just leap right into it uh, with a quick discussion. Explain how this came about. Yes. Well, thank you, Walter. Thank you. And thank you for being um, here. Always good to Sorry, be here. Sorry, I should probably a fuse more, but thank you yes, very, very much. Especially As, since I'm on the board. Yes, the right, right. Yeah. Let me just tell you how this did start. Last April was the 60th anniversary of NATO, and the heads of state met in Strasbourg, Kiel, and decided that NATO needed a new strategic concept because the last one was written in 1999, before all the new countries came in and before 9-11. There is a new Secretary General of NATO, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the former Prime Minister of Denmark, and the powers that be, the heads of state and government, thought that there should also be a group of experts. And um, so each of the NATO countries named an expert. I was named by the United States. And then uh, Secretary General Rasmussen chose um, 12 countries to be um, as individuals on this group of experts, automatically irritating 16 countries, and <laughs> asked me to chair it. And um, what we did was to have a number of seminars, four actually. One that kind of put all the horrors of the world on the table to kind of see what the security environment was. The second one was to examine some of the NA recent NATO missions. Um, mostly out of area, obviously. The third was um, how, what the role of partnerships were. And the fourth one was um, what the military capabilities were to match desires with capabilities. We also had meetings in Russia um, and had consultations with a variety of organizations, including the United Nations, the OSCE, EU, the Mediterranean Dialogue, the Istanbul Initiative, and basically to see how the whole thing could work in the 21st century. What we came up with was that this alliance, which is the most powerful military alliance in the history of the world, needs to be more agile and versatile in a period of complete unpredictability. And what happened as a result, when we put all the horrors of the world on the table first and thought NATO needed to do everything, Somebody presented a really good image, which is that if that were true, <coughs> NATO would look like a Swiss army knife with all the things extended, meaning that you couldn't even pick it up. Therefore, it was important to really determine what NATO was good at and what it should be able to do. I think the thing that came to me that was most interesting was actually the evolution of partnerships. And that came out of this uh, of the meeting that we had, seminar, it was in Norway, we, uh, kind of the, the motto of the whole thing was that there were more partnerships than there were allies. And that um, it was important to try to figure out how NATO could plug in to those partnerships and how uh, that would help extend the reach in a way that was practicable. We, uh, we thought that NATO needed to have a lot of reforms um, and that clearly the financial crisis was going to affect how NATO would be funded. And part of the problem is, was that each country that's a member of NATO is supposed to provide 2% of its GDP to NATO as budget, and only six out of the 28 actually do that. So um, given the deficits and Are all that. Are we one of the six? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, no, we, we actually do better. But that's the other part of the story, is to what extent is NATO basically American and the other countries really do or don't contribute. The relationship with Russia is interesting, and we can uh, talk yeah. more about that. And then the other issue that uh, needs to be on the table was the whole issue of, of nuclear weapons. And uh, <coughs> we did frame it in the following way. In terms of how President Obama had framed already, it would be good if we were able to move to a nuclear-free world. But until we're there, uh, we have to figure out how, the, how deterrence works. And for NATO, what that means is that so long as nuclear weapons are there, NATO is a new, is the deterrence for NATO is a nuclear deterrent in addition to missile defense. Uh, 
if there is a nuclear deterrent, then the tactical nukes need to, whatever decisions are made on the tactical nukes, have to be done by the alliance as a whole and uh, as a result of talks with the Russians, so not a unilateral uh, <coughs> withdrawal, either by a country or by NATO, without um, having uh, <coughs> overall discussion. So it was, um, I, we turned over our, the report is a draft that is supposed to go, did go to the Secretary General. I presented it to the North Atlantic Council last Monday, uh, and we had a, a tour of the table on it, and, and now the Secretary General is going to write a draft. Uh, he will then do official consulting on it, and then he will take it to the heads of state in Lisbon in November, and theoretically NATO will have a new strategic concept <coughs> for the next decade. So that's yeah, a moment ago you said uh, you looked at the most recent NATO missions, and obviously all of them out of area. And just that word obviously popped out. Uh, how do you establish guidelines for NATO going out of area, especially since the original yeah. concept of NATO was well, not to go well, out of area? Well, one of the really interesting things was that there are somewhat different views within the alliance. There are those countries, and we have this in here, uh, who have a different view, historical and geographical view of Russia. And for them, Article 5 seems to be, which is, by the way, well, what I'm the wearing. The pen is Article uh, 5, if you're um, uh, the, uh, uh For them, that security reassurance that comes with a restate, a, a renewal of vows to Article 5 was, was the really crucial part. On the other hand, everybody also agreed that the threats that are out there are primarily coming from outside the area. And they are like cyber threats, um, kinds of um, events like insurgencies, what was going on in Afghanistan, ethnic conflicts such as were in the Balkans. So the guidelines we talked about was that um, they would have to be really doable, that they'd have to have support, they'd have to be, and, and let me back up on something. Afghanistan was, was and is a big issue for NATO. We as experts were trying to figure out how not to um, have, in fact we couldn't even think of the right word, whether Afghanistan was a test or a mission, because this is a strategic concept for a decade, not for the next year. And we did not want to be tied into what actually was going on in Afghanistan beyond trying to figure out what the lessons of Afghanistan mm -hmm. were. And the lessons were the following. First of all, um, as, as you all know, um, when after 9-11, NATO for the first time activated Article 5. One of the members had been hit, and so it was to be defended by all. The United States, for whatever reasons we don't have to discuss, uh, decided that was not the way to go and uh, went pretty much with a, a, a unilaterally or with a coalition of the willing and only later did NATO come into it. And so what happened was that there was not initial planning. Uh, <coughs> there were really dysfunctional aspects of some of the command. Uh, you have the problem of national caveats, which makes it harder to pursue uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. So we kind of looked at Afghanistan and drew the lessons out of it. Um, and that is the way that we considered uh, Afghanistan. Un under those criteria, if Jake is able, able to get a Middle East peace, would NATO be the proper, um, of, would that be a proper role for NATO to um, guarantee that? Well, I mean, one of the things we talked about uh, in one of the seminars was, in fact, whether it would be. And people felt that it was a legitimate um, mission of NATO if, in fact, there was um, support for it in the region and if there was a willingness of decisions such as that has to be done by consensus um, and whether there would be the you, kind of judging it on its effectiveness and on the possibility that it would be supported and mm -hmm. that there would not be national caveats and that there would be planning. So yes, they would be ready, Jake. There you go, Jake. Oh. <laughs> Y'all look alike. Uh, 
what, what did you figure out about the relationship of Russia to NATO in the All future? Right. Well, that was a very interesting issue because um, one of the things that we didn't want to have happen was to have the relationship with Russia be the major point of discussion. And it was an interesting problem because NATO was obviously started as an alliance against the Soviet Union. Um, and Is Article 5 directed at Russia? No. <coughs> okay. No. All right. Uh, Article 5, no. I mean, when it was written, I guess it was. But basically, it, it's, uh, it says if one is attacked, all, you know. It, right. But I meant originally. Originally, it was. I mean, originally, the whole alliance was against the Soviet Union. And having been in office in the 90s when we expanded NATO and trying and conversations that I had with President Yeltsin, who said, why do you need NATO because Soviet Union doesn't exist, we're a new Russia. And I said to him, this is a new NATO, it is not against you, um, which they never have believed. And when we were in Russia, they had just come out with their new military doctrine in which they stated that the expansion of NATO was one of their, the, their threats that they saw as a threat. So we did not want to have Russia be the tail that wagged the dog, as I said a number of times. The Russians didn't like that statement, so they came up which, with what they said was an old Russian parable, which was the chicken has to learn from the egg. And the bottom line is I just read that in War and Peace. That oh, really? Yeah. It is? Because yeah. I always thought no, they made up those I, old I, Russian I parables. I, yeah. Well, maybe Tolstoy made it up. But, yeah. but nevertheless, all of a sudden, I'm reading it's, War and Peace, and I think, hmm, there it is. Um, what does it mean? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds better in it has, Russian. It has nothing to do with tails and wagging. So I don't. <laughs> but you know, it's like got you on another parallel. Yeah. So what happened was the following: is that um, when again when we were in office, we wrote the NATO Russia Founding <coughs> Act, which was based on the idea that there would be a NATO Russia Council, in which subjects of common interest could be and should be discussed. Uh, it met somewhat, but then would, uh, fell into disuse after the Georgia adventure. Mm -hmm. And so the question, we were trying to figure out what we would do with this. We had very interesting meetings in Russia, we, the official ones. Uh, and by the way, I have to tell you, we were, my pin. So I went in, Lavrov was, had been my counterpart as perm mm -hmm. rep, so I knew him very well. And I had on a, a pin that was a knot, and he said, so what does that mean? And I said, it's our bond. So then we were sitting across from each other. He said, I figured it out. It's James Bond. And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, no, so that's what you think of our pipelines. And I said, no, that's not it. It's a knot given to me by your predecessor, Igor Ivanov. So, so we had official meetings, and we met with a lot of the academicians. The academicians of a variety of stripes were much more supportive of all of this and wanted to see about new relationships. What we came out with on Russia in the report was that we wanted the NATO-Russia Council used more actively uh, for a number of issues that we do share, uh, fighting terrorism, drug trafficking, um, questions about um, uh, energy security in, in different ways. We ultimately came out with the fact that energy security was something that should be handled more within the EU, but mm -hmm. laying out common issues and cooperating on missile defense. We have in this that as a deterrence, in addition to the nuclear deterrent, their missile defense was seen as a deterrent and that we needed to work with the Russians on that. And I think that we dealt with this pretty elegantly, I think, in terms of squaring the circle on how some of the countries felt about Russia is we said no matter what the history or geography and, and differences of view on that, all countries in NATO believed that there needed to be engagement with Russia. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what will be the most controversial elements here? Element? Um, I think that probably the question as to uh, why NATO is out of area. Mm -hmm. because it is expensive, um, and, and um, even though we didn't really want to deal with Afghanistan, obviously what happens in Afghanistan is of import. Um, what is most innovative, which I hope is not the most controversial, is the whole partnership aspect, mm -hmm. because um, that 
came, I think, really organically out of the discussions that we had in terms of all the things that could be done. And when you talk about the Middle East, there are two that are specifically to the area. One is the Mediterranean Dialogue, and the other is the Istanbul Initiative. And so that is a way to plug in mm -hmm. quite a few countries that wouldn't be in otherwise. And obviously, Turkey, as a member of NATO, plays a very large role. Mm -hmm. Let me open it up. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Arno, would you mind letting Tony go first? Yes, sir. Um, just before I uh, offer a question, I would like to thank Huda and Samia Faruqi. This is the launch of the Huda and Samia Faruqi series, mm -hmm. and I, they could not be with us today. And I look forward to what will be a very interesting and robust uh, dialogue with them. And um, I think, Madeline, thank you for kicking off the series. But may I, um, if you could turn to Turkey a little bit and discuss the partnership opportunities there. Turkey's been very actively engaged uh, on a number of fronts, most, recent, most recently Iran. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on the Turkey-NATO role and, and as you address the issue of partnerships. Yep. Can I just, before I do that, let me specifically read, Walter, what the guidelines are for out of area. And it's very, the extent and imminence of danger to Alliance members, the exhaustion or apparent ineffectiveness of alternative steps, the ability and willingness of NATO members to provide the means required for success, the involvement of partners in helping to ensure an effective and timely remedy to the problem at hand, the collateral impact on other NATO missions and needs, the degree of domestic and international public support, conformity with international law, and the foreseeable consequences of inaction. So Does that mean if the UN objects to it, NATO wouldn't well, do it? Well, no. I mean, that is one of the issues which obviously came up in Kosovo. Right. Um, and so I, I did not sign up for that. So um, I think that, but it does show that um, there should be multilateral action and obviously cooperation with the UN, but we did not. Decide that. So a Security Council veto couldn't stop a NATO no, out of area. No, no. Got it. Yes. Sorry, Arno didn't mean to. When our allies decided to come to our assistance under Article 5 at the time of 9 11, I think most of them thought they might be in Afghanistan for five, six, seven months, but not seven or eight years. And now, of course, as we know, most of them can't wait to get out. Do you see a possibility of a major crisis there for NATO? Well, I think the problem, I mean, I can go back and um, do a lot of finger pointing on this, but I think basically um, the mission was not properly explained to the Allies. One, they were not involved from the beginning, and then it was kind of sold as one thing, turned out to be something else. There is a genuine problem in all NATO countries, including ours, um, about the duration of Afghanistan. And what I think is happening, I, at least from my conversations with people in, in Brussels and the military authorities, they are all working very hard now, and the Secretary General is, in terms of trying to explain better what this mission is about. Um, but there are issues about support for Afghanistan. Um, I do not believe, at least we, <coughs> tried very hard to, to not go in that direction, that, that Afghanistan is a crisis for NATO. Uh, we did not think that it should be the be-all and end-all of NATO, that NATO had an awful lot of other things that it had to do. So that's why we decided, Arno, to go the direction that we did to pull the lessons out of it. I mean, for instance, I was in Australia for something totally different, but I managed to have some meetings about this, and the Australians are, are major contributors to Afghanistan as partners. They had not been told up front, really, what the whole thing, how long they would have to be there, or what the whole thing was about. Mm -hmm. Tony, I didn't answer you on, um, I mean, I think that Turkey's role, first of all, what was really interesting is we did note that the premier partner of NATO is the EU. No question about that. There's overlapping membership for the most part, and the taxpayers are the same. Obviously, Turkey is not a member of the EU. And so the question, that was one of the issues that automatically came up. How does, and, and again, what was interesting, we had a Turk and a Greek on the group of experts, and they were the best friends of anybody in the whole place. <laughs> uh, 
And so there was the question as to when would Turkey and Greece resolve the Cyprus issue because it was blocking a bunch of other things. I think that there was a sense that Turkey um, really um, had a key role to play in terms of its outreach in the Middle East and that Turkey was a valued member of, um, of NATO. And that it, um, but in a also part of this um, somewhat uh, counterintuitive aspect of an alliance that was created for one reason and is doing something else, Turkey was on the border. It was the outpost. Um, one of the questions that's going to come up is generally what Turkish and Russian's relations are over the Black Sea and energy. So those are the, what we were trying to do was lay out a bunch of kind of guidelines and principles and the Secretary General and the people, have, others have to flesh it out. You did it quite well. It was yeah. a lot of uh, great information. Ned? In yeah, I was wondering if uh, NATO is going to be getting into the more uh, government building, uh, country building kinds of operations, because it goes hand in glove with any kind of military operation. Right. So uh, is that part of the strategy? Yes, and Ned, one of the big things that came out of the Afghanistan, out of the, the seminar that we held on out of area operations, was, you and I have been at the UN together, actually, um, when all of a sudden there are words that become part of the international lexicon, and now it is a comprehensive approach. And the comprehensive approach is the civilian military part. And that, and Arno, this is a little bit also back on where, that in fact, it's clearer and clearer to everybody that there is no military solution to Afghanistan. Uh, no military alone, which is true in, as one looks at what might be other problems, and that what needed, there needed to happen was the civilian uh, military cooperation. We thought that it was important for NATO to develop a small civilian <coughs> cohort to be able to be there um, before the NGOs and uh, civilian aspects of other NATO governments and partners could get in there. because. Part of the issue is security. But there clearly was an un not so much nation building, um, mm. but dirty word. dirty word that you and I invented. Uh, but basically, um, Ned was my deputy, so this is what, um, So, what, but I think it is a new concept in terms of how the civilians and the military work together. Um, generally preparation, do they train together ahead of time? Yeah. How does all that work? Um, the reconstruction teams and all that. So we, we did look into that. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, hi. I'd like to ask about 9-11 uh, and what the non-American NATO countries really think they're supposed to do after a NATO country is attacked by terrorists and not by another state. I mean, I remember the sort of awkwardness of the United States having a little trouble with NATO yeah. and in the end, the Dutch and others right. did these overflight things. But so now, other NATO countries have had major terrorist incidents. Um, was there discussion of whether that's an appropriate, whether there's an obligation <coughs> on the part of NATO countries to respond to terrorism? Well, one of the things that we talked about generally, what does armed attack? Yeah. I mean, because Article Five refers if there is an armed attack, what does that really mean? And um, what we did, that's also something slightly different, is say that what needed, that NATO is not just a military alliance, it's also a political community. And therefore, there needed to be more consultations under Article 4 of the NATO Treaty, which um, posits the idea that, that there should be more kind of literally consultations about what created the problem and what should the reaction be. One of the things that came out is that people felt that we had to be very careful about what they call the purity of Article 5. An armed attack was an armed attack. But if, in fact, there were a variety of issues that threatened a state, um, that, con that it, a country should bring it to the North Atlantic Council, have consultations under Article 4, and decide if it was an Article 5. So therefore, after 9-11, the correct scenario no, I mean, they could have gone in and, and um, um, 
some other country could have automatically, I mean, we were attacked. But um, nobody talked about it in the way you suggested. It wasn't just a matter of if the attacked country asked, but if the alliance felt that it was a, an attack on one was an attack on all. The harder one is the cyber terrorism, because it is possible to conceive that a country could be brought down. So we talked about whether the quality or quantity of the attack, if it was just made a problem as it did in Estonia, for instance, didn't bring the country down, was not an Article 5, but would be something that they would talk about within the North Atlantic Council. Um, uh, just so I get it straight, Article 5, does it make a distinction between an armed attack between a state and non-state no, actor? No, it does not. And do you think in the future that's a distinction? I, the thing that we, what is so interesting is the North Atlantic Treaty is two pages long. It has lasted for 61 years uh, and is very elegantly written and uh, we were not exactly tasked with rewriting it. Um, and so, uh, and people don't want to do that because it's kind of a little bit like the Constitution, it can be so interpreted. I think that what we left open was enough of a distinction that the non-state actor activities could be discussed within the North Atlantic Council and then the countries would make a decision about it. And a cyber attack, do you want to expand on that more? Because that's quite interesting to me. Suppose China brings down the AT&T 3G system in Washington, which may have happened this what, morning. What yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I mean, it went down this morning. We don't know why. Um, is that an attack under well, we, Article 5? I, I think let's presume that it's more serious than that. Yeah, okay. It is possible that what could happen, and I'm really speculating here, um, is that somebody, maybe we, we are not about to do this, but let's, you know, take it to the North Atlantic Council, say that they are concerned about what is going on. NATO itself, we felt, had a responsibility to protect its own communication systems, that they had to begin to take steps to make sure that all their command and control systems were properly uh, protected against a cyber attack, and then that it would be national responsibilities to deal with their cyber, each cyber attack, if it were so to happen. But, and then depending upon the, the severity of it, it would then be discussed in the NAC. Mm -hmm. Yes, just last one. Does, the, um, does NATO get involved with issues that are internal within each country but seem to be region-wide, let's say the growth radical Islam? or the threat of homegrown terrorists uh, that have a common element, but would be, be viewed normally as just something for the federal resources with each country? Well, it, these were the kinds of things that we put on the table initially, talking about when I said the first kind of putting all the horrors of the world. I think that under, nor, under most circumstances, the way we felt was that uh, probably not but if one of the countries wanted to consult about um, whether there was some kind of a connection uh, among various groups, then it was perfectly fine to bring it to the NAC, and under the Article 4 consultations, that could take place. But what was interesting, really, was that we started out um, in a way that made it seem as if, as I said earlier, that NATO could do everything. And as we looked at the, the budget issues, the capabilities, the, you know, the, these guidelines. We decided that we needed to focus on things that NATO really could do, then also to develop relationships with organizations. For instance, energy. Everybody, you know, energy security. The, it was interesting because the vice chair of this group was Jörn van der Veer, who was the chairman of Royal, had retired chairman of Royal Dutch Shell. And so he had a great deal of experience um, in all of this. And what he was saying was that, um, and we had, it wasn't just he, we had, all of us had a discussion on this, that if, for instance, there were pressures by Russia on pipelines, that that was more something that should be handled initially diplomatically, that the EU was the right group to do that, potentially the OSCE. And then if there was a specific physical attack 
on a pipeline or on an oil rig, then NATO might in fact have a role, but that it was not necessarily that NATO would immediately be involved in energy uh, security. The other thing that was a big point of discussion was the high north. When you and I were up in Svalbard. Up in Svalbard um, you and see, I are the only people who understand the Svalbard Treaty. Right. <laughs> Uh, and making it possible for uh, tankers to go up over the top, um, that um, it was interesting. The discussion there became one in which the thought was that countries should handle it nationally if there were particular problems. So we weren't out there trolling for more work for NATO. <laughs> what we were doing was trying to, to really make clear that NATO should do well the things that it, it was designed to do and to um, explore larger possibilities by by plugging in with the partnerships. I think Tony, you pointed out you thought the partnerships was mm -hmm. among the most interesting things we had done. Uh, Steve Weissman. Uh, thanks, Walter. Madam Secretary, I guess if there's anything that's out of the range of data, economic issues. Nevertheless, the economic crisis is posing a huge threat to the whole European project. Uh, and new rivalries in the business. Do you worry about any security do you worry about any security implications or ramifications to the uh, economic and financial crisis that is driving uh, many European countries apart and possibly threatening the project as I said earlier? Um, well first of all I it's interesting because we talked about this uh, last week in Brussels and the Secretary General was quite uh, proactive on this in terms of saying that he fully understood the, um, economic, the financial crisis and we were talking about it mostly in terms of the effect on budgets uh, and whether, peop whether these countries really even would provide even less than they had been, as I said only six out of the 28. And, he was saying that what needed to be done was to make more of a point of the fact that that military and political security went with economic security and that as there were um, economic disruption I don't want I'm not quoting him exactly so don't uh, but that economic disruptions in many ways made it even more important that this alliance that this community created through NATO um, provided the kind of strength and stability. Nobody, I think, foresees, one of the, the aspects about coming into NATO, one of the, the guidelines about membership is that you have resolved your ethnic conflicts and border disputes. So that's one of the attractions or the catalyst about for, for NATO countries. So people don't see that. I think that what everybody was concerned about was the pressure on the budgets as a result of the financial crisis. And so the argument that he was making was that now more than ever, given the fact that there's kind of a, a lack of trust in institutions and the things that are going on, that NATO is more important than ever as a community. I'm Mark. Again, yeah. I want to try. Uh, the national caveat issue particularly as it related to Afghanistan, to what extent did, any of the, did you assess, did the group assess how much the national caveat issue is affected detrimentally, for example, the mission, operational mission plans for NATO, uh, for example, in Afghanistan, where it really did several, you know, about a year ago. Is that something that you all addressed? Well, we addressed it only in the following way, in terms of saying that they couldn't exist, they shouldn't exist in a future mission that they really were a very serious problem in terms of unity of command um, and that it, they were to be avoided. Um, the thing that I think we had hoped to have, again, as I, just to repeat, we have not written the strategic concept. We put a bunch of ideas on the table. One would hope that what they would explore more, and it goes to Ned's point, is whether if some countries uh, contribute more in the civilian aspect or for instance are more uh, dedicated to training f uh, military forces or police forces. That's not a national caveat, it is more the way that the mission is defined. But we specifically said that the national caveats should uh, be avoided. Okay. Uh, Madam, the Iranian issues 
Well, I mean, what NATO has, um, we have a, a section, a very short section on Iran, but we basically were saying that the missile defense is the, first of all, we made clear that we did not believe that the proliferation of nuclear weapons was a good idea. And then also, one of the reasons for missile defense was against the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So um, I think that we see it as a very big deal, obviously. And the question is, it goes a little bit back again to what Tony was saying, we didn't specifically say Turkey had a role. In fact, what we wondered about was what Turkey's reaction would be as we put out that Iran was a problem. Uh, Nadi? Um, yes. I have, well, my, my question is to, to do with how would NATO, under what rubric, would it, would it respond to a request for third party intervention in the Palestinian Israeli context? I mean, if something was. <coughs> I, I think the way Did that everybody hear that? No. Uh, how would NATO respond to a request for third party intervention in the Palestinian Israeli conflict if that were to be asked for? I, I don't think we saw it as intervention in the conflict. I think we saw more a NATO role if there were a peace to be a peace to keep. And I think that if it were requested, I think NATO would. This, I'm speaking for myself. I, I think NATO would look at it quite positively. There was some discussion in one of these meetings about whether Israel should be a member of NATO. Uh, that didn't get very far. But, but I think that, that basically there was a sense that there was a role primarily, and, and let me go back on something, which is, and it goes a little bit, Walter, to your point about the UN and NATO. As any of us that had looking at a problem that needed to be solved in uh, foreign policy, you try to figure out what's there to solve it. And you look for a functional organization to do something. The reason that we did not use the UN in the Balkans was that the Russians were going to veto anything. So you then look at what the next operation is. And the strongest military com alliance in the world is NATO. Um, and um, so you go to that. Now, I think since we have reason to believe that one of the parties would not be wild about having the United Nations peacekeeping operation there, that NATO, in fact, is a potential possibility. In the Middle East. In the Middle East, yeah. It's an evolution of the idea of trusteeship. Not really. I mean, trusteeships were set up as a way to deal with territory in all kinds of ways uh, as a, I don't think NATO would see itself as an occupier, but as a keeper of the, keeping forces separate. Mark, yeah, I'm sorry. Madam oh, sorry, uh, Jeffrey, I'll get you, yep. Madam Secretary, last year, a Jeffrey. number of former officials and opinion makers in Central Europe wrote a letter, an open letter to the West, uh, questioning the strategic commitment of the West to what was happening in middle Europa as they call it. And one of the pieces of that letter that surprised me the most, and that I thought the letter got wrong, was its questioning of the efficacy and, um, and, and the value of NATO membership just a few years after they themselves became NATO members. Clearly that part of Europe benefits from European integration that you described, namely the overlay of EU membership and NATO membership has brought those countries home to Europe at 40 years uh, later, after, after World War II. Um, but is there anything in, in, in the document and the process that you've been leading that can address some of the need for residual reassurance in that part of Europe? And I, I say that there, we have someone from the Czech Embassy here. I took part in a breakfast this morning with a Czech official that really kind of laid out in stark contrast the concerns of that part of Europe and the value of their NATO membership? Well, first of all, um, having had something to do with the expansion of NATO into that part of the world, um, I think that uh, first, I, I actually thought that the document of which you speak was a mistake um, because it was kind of whiny and um, the bottom line was that 
they should, as I said to them, because they all met, under the auspices of another organization, um, they, um, I said, you know, you should be glad that, that you're not the center of attention all the time. Mm -hmm. That basically it means that there, there's a certain sense of stability. That, and I think for the new countries in NATO, there is an attraction in terms of being part of this incredibly um, strong and long-lasting alliance. Um, we believe, because there were members, uh, we had a representative from Poland and a representative from Latvia on this, uh, and we spent quite a lot of time talking about um, what it was that Central Europeans wanted and Western Europeans wanted. And what I, and as I said earlier, while there was disagreement about where they had all come from, there was agreement about the necessity of engaging with Russia. We very specifically stated in this that, the, that security was indivisible, that all members of NATO alliance were to be defended, that Article 5 was not kind of voluntary activity, that it was something that had to happen. And then my sense was, and we had, we had a meeting in Prague, actually, where we had a lot of discussions about reassure, um, reassurance <coughs> Um, strategic reassurance and the number of times that we mention Article 5 and assurance is designed in order to make clear that the treaty holds for all the countries in Europe and that there is a re that they gain a lot out of it. I don't have a sense that my sense about and it is my part of the world I have to say is that um, that there was not a concern about whether they got anything out of it. I think what they were concerned about was that it not be watered down, that that security for all not be watered down, and it definitely is not. Um, Jeffrey? Uh, Dr. Albright, I work for your old department, but uh, here I speak just privately uh, for myself, not for any of my uh, bosses. Um, I'd like to ask you about the comprehensive approach and um, the concern just personally that I have about it not being perhaps comprehensive enough. As you know, for a long time, NATO has defined the comprehensive approach in terms of um, NATO getting its uh, military kinetic activity done and then handing it off to somebody else. And so many of the double-headed EU members uh, have, until very recently, uh, continued to consider it uh, that way. But as, as you were speaking um, about um, the progress that you and your counterparts have made. I have started reading the, the document, but I haven't gotten all the way through. Um, so my first question is, do you explicitly go so far as to suggest that NATO will have civilian experts of its own? And if you do, you're not in your head, yes. Um, if you do, um, won't this um, cause some problems with these double-headed European members who, um, although they've obviously come closer um, to the, the U.S. position, which is similar to, to the one you lay out. Um, isn't there a sort of what I would call a, a catch-22.5 problem with these 23 double-headed members who um, so often have wanted the EU to be the go-to organization? Are, are you finding that they are accepting that, that NATO will be perhaps in the area alone and um, needs its own civilian capability, and if it does, will these experts, in the view of you and your colleagues, come from the same pool that the European missions draw from? And if that is the vision, would that cause us some? Well, first of all, I think that um, the comprehensive approach, I think, is the new, the new concept in many different ways, is that there is not a military solution to all this, and there is an awful lot to do. We did say that NATO, NATO needed a small civilian component, not in order to actually do the civilian part of the comprehensive approach, but to be there at the beginning before the, uh, you could really pool everybody and get them going. And also, so that there would be, we kept trying to find some image, whether it was like Lego or something, where in fact there would be a part of the secretariat where the EU 
uh, and other civilian aspects could plug into and have a, um, a reasonable conversation where you didn't have military talking to civilians, but a, a way that there could really be some kind of an understandable discussion. There's no question that the EU, we said, was the premier partner. We also suggested mechanisms for better coordination between the EU and NATO uh, in terms of exchange of, of officials. I have to say that when we started this discussion, the EU was feeling more robust than as we were concluding it. Um, but I think that there really was a sense that because there was duplication, that in fact there needed to be better coordination on and a division of labor. But the civilian part that we were suggesting for NATO was a very small cohort that would only be there to kind of get things started. I think the real problem here is, um, we also talked to the UN. The UN is more interested in the integrated approach, not the comprehensive approach because they want to play their own role. But the question is how you coordinate this, how you coordinate NGOs, many of which are multinational. So that would be another assignment for part of what's happening in the NATO Secretariat. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's interesting as a political scientist is the kind of the evolution of international organizations at the moment. And um, there are those who believe in coalitions of the willing only for these things. I happen to, you know, women are not so good at sports analogies, but it is better to have a team that practices together than some pickup game. And so um, I That's think. That's a very good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> I had to ask my job daughter. Uh, but, but I think basically that's what's going on here, is trying to develop a way that people learn to operate together. And that would be also true of some of the civilians in the military. Stan? Um, you have said that uh, the influence on you is Munich, not Vietnam. But Vietnam came out of Munich. Thus, Johnson didn't want to repeat the Munich experience. And we were in Vietnam in large part as a result of the NATO deterrent concept, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, basically a form of NATO expansion to try to bring the same sort of protection to Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Didn't work. As you say, Vietnam versus Munich. So how do you tell beforehand which commitments are Munich's and which are Vietnam's? What are the criteria? And since we're talking about the Middle East, it seems to me there's a specific example. Lebanon in the 80s, after Sovereign Shatila, we went into Lebanon to provide this sort of guarantee. And what happened? Our embassy was bombed, I mean, barracks were bombed, and we left. Mm -hmm. So why should we believe that a future NATO involvement would turn out better, the difference between Munich and Vietnam? Well, that is a very hard question, I have to say. I mean, I think, I, I was just thinking as you were saying, when I went to college, I learned many organizations that no longer exist, CENTO, CETO, a bunch of alphabet soup. That, um, and I think that it goes back a little bit to this list I read, and it has generally to do with how we all feel about commitment to each other. I think it's a genuine question at the moment. What are the things that we believe uh, affects uh, us in some other part of the world? I, I think there probably are <coughs> fewer Munichs and fewer Vietnams. There's something in between. Um, and I always resisted, and I'm now speaking purely for myself, not as a NATO expert, um, is that, um, that it is very important to <coughs> draw a line sometimes about what you're going to put up with and try to figure out what, whether some of these organizations can be made to work and not, I mean, I believe that we needed to do something in the Balkans. Uh, wasn't exactly Munich, but I also stopped buying the fact that everything was Vietnam. Every time we sat down at a table, somebody would say, well, it's going to be Vietnam. Um, and so I think that there are ways of trying to sort out which of these organizations can deal with problems that we think will spread. Abu? Yeah. My question is here, are you going to take new membership in NATO? 
NATO expansion. Yes. <laughs> I tell you, we said that NATO was open, uh, according to Article 10, the same criteria under which previous countries have been accepted in NATO, that that should hold, that Article 10 um, was open. And another question, OIC, are you thinking to dialogue with NATO with OIC, Organization of Islamic Secretariat? Yes. All the countries? We, we had laid out that um, we could, there could be dialogues with any organization. Yes, absolutely. Wait, wait, when you say NATO expansion and out of area, and you drop that Israel even was discussed at one point, can you imagine NATO expanding to a country that's not a North Atlantic country? I, I, well, I mean, this is the question, and we talked about, you know, whether you Europe is a, a geographical designation or a state of mind. Um, <laughs> But oh. it, it could be neither. I mean, we, had, we, we had fascinating discussions yeah. about this. Uh, and so we didn't, you know, we just said Article 10 was open. The thing that we got at that was very hard, again, and, and the more that you ask questions, it makes me realize what a truly interesting time I've had for the last nine months, because we've talked about all of this. We didn't necessarily write something down about it, because this is a consensus document. But one of the things we, we talked about was um, how far could, theoretically, how far could it go? Um, at a certain stage, the Secretary General talked about a global organization. NATO well, is not a global organization. It has to operate in a global world. So uh, in other words, in India, Indonesia, Japan, Australia could partner. not be? Well, nobody said they couldn't be. I mean, we, we didn't answer the question. Well, do we question. need a global organization well, like NATO? Well, we have NATO? one. It's called the United Nations. But it's not <laughs> a, um, it doesn't have an Article 5 mutual no, defense. No, but it, part of the issue was uh, that, in fact, initially in the Charter of the United Nations, Article 43 called for mm -hmm. it to have an, an army. Right. The United States, we have, I actually yeah. don't think it should have an army. But um, but the bottom line is it ha it needs enforcement mechanisms, and I think what we found was that NATO in the Balkans could act as the enforcement mechanism for the United Nations without itself becoming a global organization. Mm -hmm. But um, but in the gl in a war against uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism, or whatever you want to call it you might need a global organization. Could NATO play that role without expanding to non-European <laughs> nations? I think what it would do in that case is probably call on its partnership with the Istanbul Initiative or uh, actually call on um, countries that could be partners per se, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So th that we didn't preclude. I mean, there could be an endless number of partnerships. Okay. So um, let me go back up. F before I get to Mark, behind you, Mark, yes. Yes, Madam Secretary. Jonathan Kelly. Uh, I have a follow-up question. If you look forward maybe a little more than a decade, is there a point or is there some metric or talk of some economic variable, whether it's percentage of GDP, at which NATO will have to think about individual more, more than partners to be in terms of um, credibly working with folks, they'll have to think of a new new construct given their economic relevance of the core members of NATO. You mean whether other whether where the money would come from, or? Well, no, I think is I think is a little bit more in terms of uh, the change, the increase, the rise of certain certain as countries that aren't necessarily at the table as military powers, but will be much more important in terms of their economic relevance. Well, I think that is where the partnerships really come in and the creativity of just trying to evolve in whatever is necessary. I think the real problem that NATO does have is the matching of um, ideas with capabilities. That is where it really comes down to. And um, the question is, we had some suggestions in terms of common funding and common procurement. and streamlining the bureaucratic organizations. So we were trying to have a reality check while at the same time presenting this new idea of potential partnerships with organizations, uh, established organizations like the EU or the OSCE, also uh, with individual countries and the, the potential of working with non-governmental organizations. So we left that part very open. <laughs>
Uh, we're really at the end of time, and what I'm going to do, if I may, is there are a few people who had raised their hands. Just throw out a question. I'm going to take three or four of them, allowing you to okay. pick and choose on how you uh, wrap it up. And I'll start with Mark. I, Walter, I appreciate that. You, um, she answered my question. Okay. Here, which was yours. Great. It, yeah. uh, did you ever at any point consider putting a sunset provision on NATO? It seems to me from the questions here, we have the worst of all possible worlds. You have this organization that's supposed to do something, but members can do it or not do it, depending on what they yeah. want. Hey, David. When the U.S. had the opportunity a couple of years ago to expand NATO, um, it seemed that Russian opposition really nipped that in the bud. At the time, the U.S. position was that it would not rule out even inviting Russia to become a member of NATO. Is that still a possibility? Mm -hmm. And I think there was one last one, was it? Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's it. similar. Okay. If you could elaborate a little bit more on the kinds of things you've heard in Russia, specifically um, about their desires for a broader organization that they're part of, future the OSCE vis-a-vis -vis NATO, mm -hmm. and then that question about enticing Russia to actually join the alliance. Uh, first of all, Larry, there was never a discussion about sunsetting. I think there really was a sense that this was a remarkable organization, but that it needed to be um, tuned up a bit um, or sorted out for what its mission is. I think what is interesting. Um, I know there's a report out that said something like, um, if you had to invent NATO today, you wouldn't have it. On the other hand, I think what is interesting um, is the num are the number of countries that want to be members of NATO, uh, which makes it it's a little bit your question mark, you know, in terms of what do they get out of it. I think they mostly feel they do, and so nobody suggested that. Um, on the Russia issue, it's very interesting, is that uh, we have, as I said, we didn't want the tail to wag the dog, but we spent a lot of time on the relationship with Russia and had said in there that um, we were, first of all, we thought that the NATO-Russia Council needed to be were much more active and really that there were any number of subjects that could come up, that we should be seeking ways to find common activity with the Russians, that there were many that really were, uh, could be handled in common because the threats were similar. And I think the most proactive thing we said was in terms of sharing and working on missile defense together. We did not address whether Russia should be a member of NATO or not, but didn't close the door on it either because of the way if you talk about in terms of all the potential that can happen in, in finding common ground, uh, and at the same time, if they live up to the various, you have to be a democracy for one. Uh, and so, you know, we, we did not um, exclude it. The, the discussion, and in Russia, what was interesting is that um, I think that um, the, if there are some Russians, I think, that would like to see NATO as an enemy. Um, there are others who thought that it was useful to look for ways to expand what could be done in the NATO-Russia Council. There are some Russians who believe that we force countries to be members of NATO, which is why we put in here, it goes without saying that NATO is a voluntary organization. One of the things that was a little hard to deal with is that the Bucharest um, Declaration had said Georgia and Ukraine will be members of NATO, but Ukraine has now temporarily or whatever decided they don't want to be members of NATO. So we, we put in there that it was a voluntary organization, that the NATO-Ukraine Commission and the NATO-Georgia Commission, which are separate from uh, whether they're members or not, needs to continue to do its work. So we left a lot of, you know, we tried to kind of put all the elements down on the table. There are different, again, just to repeat, there are different views among members of the alliance about how they view Russia, but they all want to engage in some form or another. And all the countries agreed. And then we did a round the table last week at the NAC. Um, there really was a sense, there was nobody who said, we're not going to deal with Russia. Mm -hmm. So it, it, some of it is how Russia wants to engage with NATO. Mm -hmm. I think the Russians at various uh, open meetings that I've been at do not like 
some of the language that NATO uses and says that if they use that kind of language, we would think that they were aggrandizing. However, Russia is one country and NATO is a multilateral alliance that has lasted 60 years. Secretary Albright, uh, thank you very much for your thank service you. on this. I want to say to Secretary Albright, um, you're a treasurer of the Aspen Institute, you're an American treasurer, you're now a global treasurer as well. Secretary Albright has taken on this duty to do uh, this NATO for the Secretary General. Yeah. You also have your own private NATO, which is Madeline and her ex-ministers, right. which Under is sort Aspen. of parallel because right. you're expanding and not making yeah. it just Atlantic anymore, meeting in Madrid in early October yeah. for the opening of Aspen, Spain. But you've also agreed to chair the Partnership for a New Beginning, right. which Tony Verstandig and Mickey yeah. Bergman are working on with us, which is uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, attempt to uh, do the follow-up of President Obama's Cairo speech for outreach to the Muslim world. And I won't list the other things, because you're not exactly monogamous. No. You actually work with other organizations <laughs> besides Aspen. <laughs> so thank you very much for all of your service, Secretary Albright. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh,